head and just play you guys vocabulary, which is kind of first gets us into Jim Crow. So just listen right now. That's all you gotta do, okay? Definitely take out about two or three pieces of paper though. Actually, let me pause this, make sure I got the video for y'all can hear it. Uh, Go ahead and mute yourselves if you're, unless you're trying to talk to me. All right. So listen up now, guys. Listen up. Uh. Race in America, a unique problem. Self-reflection is necessary for solving. How did we get here? Aren't we all equal? Does the legacy of slavery still impact people? We gotta think about how this country was built to examine some attitudes that exist still. Racist attitudes over time evolve. They go back to what were known as Jim Crow laws. A wide ranging set of laws and customs. They were written into law and society enforced them. Separate schools, pools, and ticket booths. And interracial marriage was illegal too. Every part of daily life was restricted. For blacks in the South, the system was wicked. This was post-slavery and post-reconstruction. Protection for blacks was totally given up on, you see. Some whites believed in fixed racial order, that whites were superior over all others. And if Jim Crow laws were broken, violence and lynchings were the repercussions. For instance, Emmett Till was lynched at 14 years old. Reportedly, he looked at a white woman and whistled. This was 60 years ago. Not that long, and this Jim Crow mindset lingers on. You gotta look back to learn what it was, will be. And listen, the past ain't always pretty. What you know about Jim Crow? It shows why American history isn't so simple. Gotta look back to learn what it was, will be. And listen, the past ain't always pretty. What you know about Jim Crow? It shows why American history isn't so simple. So old Jim Crow settled over the South, and those with the means to do so got out. Thousands fled in the Great Migration, heading north to escape strict segregation. Others stayed and took major risks to fight Jim Crow and seek justice. The fight to end Jim Crow had just begun, and things got real with Plessy vs. Ferguson. This was 50 years before Rosa Parks, Homer Plessy sat in a whites only train car. The case was heard before the Supreme Court. The ruling is how separate but equal was born. Pretty dark times, but there was still a spark that became a fire. Activists did their part. Booker T. Washington, a former slave, believed educated blacks would bring about change with education. He saw financial freedom, so he founded Tuskegee Institute for his people. And the NAACP was founded by W.E.B. Du Bois to protect black lives after decades of injustice and Jim Crow laws and the NAACP fighting them in court. These things formed the perfect storm in 54. Brown versus the Board of Ed in the Supreme Court. And Thurgood Marshall successfully argued that separation was not equal. This ruling overturned Plessy Ferguson and ended laws that supported segregation. Jim Crow was no longer the law of the land, but it didn't disappear overnight, understand? The fight for your rights is a fight for your life, so when the story is told, be on the right side. You gotta look back to learn what it was, will be, and listen, the past ain't always pretty. What you know about Jim Crow? It shows what American history is a so simple, gotta look back to learn what it was, will be, and listen, the past ain't always pretty, what you know about Jim Crow, it shows what American history is a so simple, gotta look back to learn what it was, will be, and listen, the past ain't always pretty, what you know about Jim Crow, it shows what American history is a so simple. So before we get started, um, 
open your mics up. Tell me, what do you guys already know about Jim Crow? He was a um, racist character, okay. and um, they made laws about him to stop black people from doing things. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. Whoever wants to go first. I heard a lady going first. Let the lady go first. And then I think Khalil, I heard your voice. Um, I believe Jim Crow laws did um, hurt voting. Like when they... Um, Did you finish? Because you, you stopped. Okay. I finished. Okay. Oh. Kula, go ahead. <laughs> um, I remember reading that he was an actor who would rub coal on his face or had coal on him and then embody or try to create stereotypes of what a Black man would act. And then through that, they then made Jim Crow laws that, um, I guess, separated um, this transportation or public accommodations, mm -hmm. all stuff that should be just equal and not have to be differentiated by um, color of skin, but was in Southern states, I believe. Okay. Now, one thing I do want to make sure you guys know is that um, Jim Crow was predominant in the South but it wasn't just in the South. You guys got that? It was dominant down here in the South, but not only in the South. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you guys about the Jim Crow rap um, after we get done, but first thing I need to do first, get into Jim Crow. So um, I would highly suggest you guys, uh, this is what I would do. Thank you guys for those people that did the um, note-taking assignment that I, uh, pat, I signed over the weekend, um, and also the strategy for passing the test. For those people that did it, how did you guys? What did, how did how did you guys like it? Did it help you guys out? For the people that did the Nearpod, did it help you guys out? Uh, yeah, yeah. What did how did it help you? Nearpod this weekend. Yeah, I gave y'all one over the on Friday. Yeah. What did it help out with? What did it help you do? Just just feedback. Um, it helped get a better understanding on what Jim Crow laws affected and then people who were very influential. Are you talking about the Nearpod over the weekend? Not the Jim Crow Nearpod, the other Nearpod, oh. the one. Okay. So over the, over the weekend, I gave you guys a study, study workshop, which is that I asked some people to do. I had like a handful of people that I saw that did it. And it really just went on like how to take notes and like why using one of these three methods is the best way to take notes. And it also talked about um, how the strategies for taking a test. So for those people that did it, thank you so much for doing it. Um, I would highly suggest you guys take notes on this right here using one of these methods. But today I'm going into Jim Crow, all right? So um, you guys had an assignment on this last week. I wanna go more in depth with it. So make sure you guys are taking notes. This is being recorded, it's gonna be posted online, but make sure you let me know if you have any questions, okay? Tomorrow, you are more than likely gonna have a quiz on Jim Crow. Is that right, clear there? These yeah. notes that you guys are taking today is gonna be meant to help you guys out. So just listen um, and pay attention. Ask questions if you have, this is a discussion, so I need y'all to work with me, okay? So I ask y'all to read, please make sure you guys read, make sure you guys read allowed to. All right, first, um, Jim Crow was a time period in the 1900s following, shortly following the Civil War. And as we talked about earlier, um, Jim Crow laws was based off of earlier Black codes, okay? So here, by the 1900s, many of the gains made by Black Americans during the Reconstruction have been taken away because of these laws. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, can I get someone to start reading here to read the slide for me? Anybody wants to read the slide for me? I'll read. Go ahead. Okay. Three different approaches to African-American equality. Most African-Americans favor social integration, 
Many blacks and some whites called for racial separation. Many whites looked for ways to keep races separate and unequal through voluntary segregation, called for separation of the races in daily life, developed into a new era of discrimination called the Jim Crow era that lasted nearly 100 years. Okay. So that is all Jim Crow was separate but equal. That's the big hiss, gist of it. But it's a lot more going on here as well. All right. So let's talk about the history of Jim Crow. The origins of Jim Crow can really be traced back to a song and dance. That's kind of something that you guys were talking about earlier. Um, it was, the song was known as Jump Jim Crow. It happened in 1828. It was by a white comedian known as Thomas Rice. Okay, I just want to read the next um, bullet point here. Rice created this routine earlier in the decade. He was supposedly, supposedly inspired by watching a crippled black man known as Jim Cuff on a Cincinnati levee dancing on his own accord. After some time, he imitated this dance while smearing grease paint on his face, a technique now known as blackface. Okay. So what blackface is basically what happens is when you have, a, um, typically what you have is a white person put um, cocoa butter on their face to try to protect their face, and then they use charcoal. You know how if you ever get charcoal and you wet it, it becomes like a paste, right, y'all? Yes, no? Yeah. And you put that on your face, and that's how you get the black face, okay? Here is a picture of Jim Crow. This is the cartoon character of him. As you can see, he's happy, he's dancing. Um, that's Jim Crow, okay? Here's a picture of the gentleman who, what, what was this guy's name again? Thomas Rice. Yes, this is Mr. Rice in blackface. You can see him in the bottom left, how he normally looks, and then you can see him in the top right. And again, he's a comedian. This is when you have the start of minstrel shows. Make sure you guys know minstrel shows. Um, minstrel shows are basically when you had shows that depicted blacks based off of stereotypes, stereotypical images that was in the media. Y'all know, y'all heard of, uh, you know, the, um, oh my gosh, it's, you get, Anta, An, Anti, Jim, the Serp, I can't think of the name of the Serp, Anta, Anti, um, somebody help me out. Aunt Jemima. Hey, yeah, Aunt Jemima, um, you also look at Uncle Ben, all those were initially based off of stereotypes coming from this time period, which is why there's a big push in 2020 to put, to change it. Does everybody got me on that? Go Google those names. You'll see totally different um, characters of them that we now buy in the grocery stores. Okay. You guys with me so far? Yeah. Okay. So here's another picture of him. You can see he makes his eyes be really, really big because the stereotype was well, black folks have big eyes. They get scared very easily. The darker face. And then they use um, lip, lipstick to make the lips be white and look bigger. Okay. Based off all stereotypes. All right, so here's a video I want you guys to watch. We're going to try to watch all of it, but just pay attention, okay? This is the rise and fall of Jim Crow. All you gals and boys, I'm just from Tuckahoe. I'm going to sing a little song. My name's Jim Crow. Wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. I went down to the river. In 1836, Jim Crow is born. He begins his strange career as a malicious minstrel caricature of a black man, created by a white man to amuse white audiences. Jim Crow would come to symbolize one of the most tragic eras of race relations in American history, a time deeply rooted in promise and contradiction. 1865, four million Americans, slaves simply because they were born black, were now free. But in little over a decade, that promise was gone replaced by a rigid system of laws designed to keep blacks from experiencing any of their newly achieved rights. It would be known as the era of Jim Crow, the American form of racial apartheid. 
But I tried to lean inside and get me a cup of water. And those white people beat me till I was unconscious. They thought I was dead. My dad said, as long as you're living in this South, you're going to have to go to the back door in this town. And you just settle for that. He said, but one thing I want you to swear and promise to me, that you will never get used to it. I'm not ashamed of the segregated and Jim Crow experience, all because we were able to devise techniques for survival that permitted us to abide our time and to wait until our change comes. Okay, that's kind of where I want to stop. I am going to post this on YouTube, and I'm also going to give you guys a link to this presentation so you can go back and finish watch, looking at this if you want to, okay, y'all? Yep. All right, so now we talk about the Redeemer governments, okay. So in the 1870s, white Democrats, keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen, Democrats during this time period is very different than what we see Democrats doing this um, right now, okay? So white Democrats who favored segregation began to gain power in the South. A Democrat back then would be what we consider right now in the 21st century a Republican. Is that right, got me on that? Whereas a Republican would be what we consider right now as a Democrat. We'll talk about why that changed later. Does everybody follow that first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Now, these Southerners referred to um, new governments as redeemer governments, and the idea is that they wanted to redeem what it was like before the, civ before the Civil War. That same system as far as oppression and the system of slavery. Is that right, got me on that? Yeah. yeah. All right. So what the redeemer lawmakers did pass, they passed Jim Crow laws. These Jim Crow laws were very much similar to the Black Holes that was passed um shortly after the civil war during reconstruction and what well, basically throughout the whole south it forced blacks to ride in separate railroad cars separate restaurants attend separate schools the idea is separate but equal which was solidified with the plus v ferguson supreme court case now in the north the laws were less widespread but black americans still dealt with prejudice blacks were denied admittance in the hotels restaurants and theaters so it wasn't just in the south it was specifically worse in the south you guys with me so far? Yes. Okay. So there's three major events. First off, you had the legalizing of segregation with the slaughterhouse cases. Okay. Now, I hope you guys are taking notes on this because this is what you guys going to do your Jim Crow raps on. A lot of these key vocabulary words. The slaughterhouse cases were where you have slaughterhouse owners who argue Louisiana law violated the 14th Amendment. The 13th Amendment ended slavery. The 15th Amendment gave all um, males the right to vote. The 14th Amendment gu guaranteed all Americans to have citizenship under the law. Is that right? Got me on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The courts did not agree. 14th only protected the rights of national citizenship, not the rights guaranteed by states. Okay. Therefore, the cases later used it to justify Jim Crow laws and the creation of separate facilities in states. Okay. So in other words, the, fourth, what they, the court said here in the slaughterhouse cases is that the 14th Amendment only goes to national citizenship. It does not talk about how the states see you. Is that right? Follow me on that. That's still relevant even right now. Okay. In the 21st century, uh, during the COVID, everything that happened in the summer of 2020, that's still very much relevant because it says here that the state still can dictate what it does because it's the 14th Amendment only protects you on a national level. Does everybody understand that, Jim? You guys with me? Yeah. Yes. The next thing was Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson was a landmark Supreme Court case that gave the idea of separate but equal. In this case, it, uh, the court agreed that segregation was lawful as long as blacks and whites had access to equal facilities. It is sad to say they have to be the same facilities on equal, meaning separate um Black school, white school, uh, black store, or white store. Y'all follow going with that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is just talking about, this is what Justice Henry um, said in majority opinion, talk about what the Supreme Court did. 
You guys can take a second and look over this and come back and look at the recording of this if you so wish. I kind of summed it up for you already. Then you have black disenfranchisement, all right? Can I get someone to read this slide for me? I'll read it. Go ahead. Black disenfranchisement, new black codes included unfair voting laws, adding literacy tests to their voting restrictions. Many blacks had received no education, could not pass tests. States voting fee called a poll tax, poor and illiterate whites were exempted by grandfather clause. If grandfather eligible to vote, then that person could vote as well. Does everybody make sense on these laws and what they were doing? Yeah. yeah. So basically, again, you had to pay a tax. Um, grandfather, if your grandfather was a slave, could you vote? No. No, you couldn't. You also have to pass a literacy test saying, okay, here's an example. I'm going to ask you guys this. Name me one senator from Georgia. Kelly Loeffler. David okay. Perdue. Okay. David okay. Perdue. All right, so you two would have passed the literacy test. Now I'm going to ask you guys this question. Go ahead and recite the whole Declaration of Independence. If you can't do it, just say I can't do it. Four score. Can you, do y'all see, this is, this will be what a literacy test will ask you guys. And as, as Americans, we can even, we still can probably still not pass this test. This is what many blacks were put up against. Does everybody follow me on that? Yes. All right. So here's another video for us to watch. Talk about Pleasant v. Ferguson and the Jim Crow era. So listen up, y'all. You guys hear okay? In 1895, Black yes. people in Louisiana decided to test the constitutionality of the new laws. One segregation law required separate railroad cars for Negro passengers. Homer Plessy sat down in a car reserved for whites and was arrested. Because of the 14th Amendment and its Equal Protection Clause, Plessy never imagined the Supreme Court would rule against him. But it did. The court upheld his conviction in a decision which would shape race relations for half a century. In Plessy versus Ferguson, it ruled the 14th amendment could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or a commingling of the races and the tragedy of plessy is that having then held that you could discriminate on trains the doctrine then was applied to a whole host of other areas to all public accommodations to boxing matches, to education, and in some instances in the early years in housing. And it gave the imprimatur that the law in America could do to blacks what it couldn't do to Irishmen or Italians or Jews. The Plessy decision introduced a new phrase into the language, separate but equal. 21 states would soon pass segregation laws under the protection of Plessy. The turn of the century saw the existence of two Americas, one white and one colored. Colored America could not eat in white restaurants, play in white parks, die in white hospitals, or be buried in white cemeteries. Oklahoma even segregated phone booths. Mississippi segregated Coke machines. In Atlanta, a Negro witness could not swear on white Bibles. Florida segregated not only the schools, but even the textbooks in storage. If you want to ride the bus, then you put your nickel in the slot and you go into the back of that bus and you sit down and shut up. And if you came in that bus as a white person and you wanted my seat, then I got up and gave you my seat. We were not supposed to mix the races. That was the law, the law of the land. So you had to abide by that law or otherwise, you went to jail. It was just that simple. This was the era of Jim Crow. Any questions so far, you guys? No. No. Okay. Keep going then. 
All right, so now, look at what happens. Let's take a second look at this map, or this graphic, rather. What you guys can see here is from 1876 to 1892, and then you go straight to 1924. This is the estimated African-American voter turnout in the South. Why do you guys think there's a decline in voter turnout in the South after 1876? This is the end of the Reconstruction. Why do you guys think there was a lower voter turnout? Was this after the um, um, the Jim Crow laws? This was the period after you know separate but equal, but people still didn't want them to like yeah. try and vote, so they scared them off. Exactly, it was these Jim Crow laws and also even the violence. We're gonna get into some of the violence in a second. Let me say this to you guys now. Um, in about maybe ten to fifteen minutes, you guys will see some images that are kind of disturbing. This is one reason why I got waivers from you guys. Okay. <laughs> So I'm gonna give you a warning right now. You guys will see some images coming up of things that happen. But I'm gonna show you guys these images because these are actual factual images. Y'all got me on that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's your warning. All right. So you also have some race riots that occurred. Now keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. You guys got these Jim Crow raps coming up. Everything I'm telling you guys is gonna have to be part of that Jim Crow rap, which is why I'm trying to make sure you guys have more background on it. Now you have a number of race riots. Okay. You had uh, the first major riot happened in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. You also had one here in the Atlanta area in 1906. Um, the number of race riots increased. Lynchings and race riots were more common in the South, and they, but they both occurred in the South and the North. So you had them in the North too. You had a Chicago race riot in the North. You had some other ones as well. Y'all with me so far? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's an example of some of the um, pictures that's coming from the race riots um, that occurred. Some of these are also from the race riots that occurred here in Atlanta. And notice how the people are looking. They're smiling. They're looking in the background. So this is also going to come up when we talk about lynching. This was kind of a normal thing. Is everybody follow me on that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here's our artistic uh, representation of it. You guys also heard of the Tulsa race riot. Also, some other ones that happened all in the same time period. Okay. Lynching. Warning now, you're about to get some images, okay? Is everybody with me on that? Can I get someone to start reading this for me, please? Keep this in mind. Every time y'all participate, I'm taking note of it, and it helps y'all grade out. Um, okay. Uh, racial violence on the rise, lynching. Most common, forms of racial vi most common forms of racial violence in the late 1800s were lynchings, murders of individuals without trial, um, nearly 900 Blacks lyn lynched from 1882 to 1892. Many committed no crime. Black journalist uh, Ida, Wells, Ida Wells Barnett fought to expose and end the practice. Lynchings were extremely common, you guys, extremely common. Um, in fact, I'm gonna give you guys a second just to look at this, okay? Oh yeah, my mom told me, uh, <laughs> my mom told me when she was a kid, she actually had a cross burned in her uh, a front yard that was very common okay can everybody see this screen okay yes yes okay um miss levine see if you can maybe um go out and jump back in because um and i'm gonna have this recorded too all right so between 1882 and 1951 Ladies and gentlemen, this is an estimate, estimated number. Roughly a, about 4,730 people were lynched in the United States. 3,437 were black, 1,293 were white. The most lynchings happened in 1892, which is about 203. 161 of those were black. But again, what did I put there in big bold print? What did I say there? These, these statistics are what? That's accurate may not be very accurate. And the reason why, there were so many people being lynched, not everybody got counted. Is everybody got me on that? So what you see are the people dying. Now, yeah. the Chicago Tribune did not start keeping record of the lynchings until 1882. And then the NAACP, when it was founded, they, started keep, they did not start keeping records until 1912. So you got a long period of time where no one's keeping record on any of these lynchings. Is everybody following me there? Y'all with me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So here are the lynchings. So again, this will be a powerful video. So be ready. Okay, you guys? 
You're not going to watch the whole thing. You guys can watch most of it on your own. In fact, I am not going to show this to you guys. You guys, this I'm going to give you guys a link to this presentation. You can watch this on your own. Um, but the orders of lynching culture in the United States, I would definitely say watch that video. It's about 10 minutes long, but it gives you guys a lot more for you to visualize it. But you guys can see it from this picture right here. These are two men that were here with lynch. And what's, what, describe, the, describe this picture. What do you guys see the people doing here in this, in this picture? Just watching. Smiling, pointing. Smiling, pointing. Do you think people really had an issue with this? No. Okay, the people actually, in this picture. The people yeah, in this picture. Actually, I actually heard that uh, people back then actually used this as a form of entertainment. It was. It was on postcards. I'm going to show you guys some postcards in a second of lynchings. Um, people used to take pieces of the person that got lynched for souvenirs. Um, mm. It was very, very harsh, but it happened frequently, okay, ladies and gentlemen? It happened a lot. All right, so here's some um, more detail about the lynchings. In the deep south compared to the border states, what you see here in this map is well, all the lynchings only in the south. Were all the lynchings in the South, you guys? No. No. They happened across the country. You even had lynchings out in California. Does everybody got me on that? Yeah. Okay, so it wasn't just in one area. Now, the majority of them happened in the South, but not only just the South. So I'm getting that. All right. So why the news? Okay. Well, the news has a lot of, um, remember I told you guys images are coming up. The news has a lot of historical significance to it. But I, I can't honestly get into it right now. Um, so why does lynching affect us so much today? Are you guys ready? Yeah. OK. If you're not ready, this might be the time to keep hearing me, but maybe move away from the screen because there might be some images. OK, I said the same thing as in the classroom. All right, so first off, you have lynching in Columbia University, University of Maryland, and you also have one in Gina High School. In fact, you have I'm sorry about you guys. Uh, so you had these more recent issues of lynching that happened in the late 20th century, meaning like the 1900s, both at the University of Maryland, Columbia University, and also in Gina High School. Later on in the class, we're gonna talk about the Gina Six, but that was a very big issue back in this time period. So it didn't just happen in the 19, early 1900s, is what I'm getting at. Um, this is a noose, you have the rope, and again, the rope be tied up and goes around a person's neck, and you basically be strangled to death and they'll throw you over a tree, and that's where you be hanging from. It's called, it's a song, remember you guys saw it in the Nearpod, it's called Strange Fruit. You guys remember that? Yeah, no. Remember the song, Strange yeah. Fruit? It was based off the idea of lynching. That's what she's literally talking about in that song, Strange Fruit. Kanye West went out and did a remix to it a couple years ago. Okay, so what role did the media outlets play in making lynching mainstream? Well, Here's a lynching right here in Dallas, Texas, 1910, Duluth, Minnesota, to really show you guys that it did not only happen in the South, but they took pictures of it. It was a local gathering, as someone said earlier, it was a form of entertainment for some. Um, you also even had postcards made of lynchings. These are actual postcards coming from the Library of Congress, okay? People actually have postcards of these. If you guys go to the, um, when it opens back up, the National Museum of Black History, you guys can see some of these in that museum. Here is a painting of it. Is there a follow me so far on what I'm getting at? Yeah. yeah. Okay. KKK, Ohio. This is coming, this is a, from a newspaper. Okay, why were the oppressors not ashamed to be in these pictures? Well, again, we said it was kind of, it was common, it was normal. This was just part of normal daily life. Um, these are some of the images that you see here, people being burned, people, they cut legs off, feet, and it's just be like, okay, let's take a picture around the hanging um, of this person. 
And not every single person here did this as a crime. Is everybody got to be on that? Sometimes we just caught up. We had to lynch somebody today. Not every single person was guilty of doing some kind of crime. But then I also will ask yourself, and this is a rhetorical question, was any crime worth this type of punishment, though? Okay. All right. Since they are taking these photos, were they desensitized or are we just too sensitive? I'm asking you guys that. Were they desensitized to this or are we just too sensitive to it? I'm asking you guys that. And try to be within reason and try to think about what we're talking about. Were they just desensitized to this or are we just being just overly sensitive about it? Let's talk um, about it. I'd argue that the dehumanization that took place during slavery never stopped. And as a result, white people were very desensitized to black pain. Okay. I think I said no, but I think I saw your mouth coming open. So go ahead. Oh, I said they were desensitized. Okay. Anybody else? Same here with it being desensitized. And you gotta think about it. To a degree, we also are desensitized by some things right now in the 21st century. I'm not saying that specifically, but there is a level of desensitization because we see it so much. Has everybody got me on that? We may not be going running outside taking pictures in front of people because again, we don't have to do that because we have TV and internet. We see things a lot. There's a certain point after 9-11 that we were seeing people's heads getting cut off uh, by the Taliban. Is there, I got me on that? We become desensitized to a certain level of violence. Think about it, in our video games, we have video games that Call of Duty, for example, that are literally about war video, video games. So you do have a level of desensitization. All right, so get a second. Who, anybody know who this guy is? Or this young man? Emmett Till. Edmund Till. Emmett Till. So because y'all said that, I'm assuming some of you guys know what happened to Emmett Till. What happened to Emmett Till? Anybody want to talk to me about that? What happened to Emmett Till? Basically, he was accused of staring at a white woman, and he ended up being chased. Well, not being chased. He ended up being dragged from his home by, like, two white men who, like, um, mutilated him. Yes. And y'all ready? Y'all ready to see the... I'm about to show you guys the picture. This is Emmett Hill till before he got killed. I'm about to show you all the picture. Y'all ready? I'm saying this because I can't see y'all faces and see y'all ready, so I'm kind of... Yeah, we're ready. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This is what Emmett Till was like. His mother wanted to have an open casket for the whole world to see what they did to his kid, her kid. Emmett Till is from Chicago. The story goes, he whistled at a white lady, and this is what they did to him for it. Did everybody follow me on that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So again, make sure I'm just going through the history, telling you guys the stuff that happened. Everything I'm showing you guys came from the Library of Congress. You can literally go Google this stuff. It's right there on the internet. Now, out of lynching, out of Jim Crow, we had the NAACP that got emerged and started happening. So the NAACP, the NAACP was founded after the Springfield race riots in 1908. Um, it was led by W.E.B. Du Bois. Okay. He saw one of the, the main scholar that really kind of pushed me to get my doctorate degree and the reason I even went to Clark Atlanta University because he used to teach at Clark University. Uh, Springfield, Illinois was a rapidly growing industrial center. Remember you had the Great Migration where you had all the Blacks moving from the South, moving up North because of more jobs, things of that nature. Uh, fierce job competition and use of Black workers as strike breakers during labor strikes caused increased tension. So the companies brought in Black workers who wanted to work and they became... Um, what do you call it? They came, um, they crossed the picket lines and to make things work. So an attack on a white mob against a black section of Springfield spurred the creation of NAACP. And the NAACP, the main goal during that time period was really to look at and try to fight for legality issues as far as fight for blacks through laws. <clears throat> like I alluded to, um, you had the Great Migration which lasted from, this is the first one from 1910 to 1930. This is where you had black Americans migrate from the south to industrial cities in the north. They were trying to escape Jim Crow. They were trying to escape um, the lynchings. And also they had more jobs in the north too. Okay. Can I get someone to read this quote by W.E.B. Du Bois? Anybody can read this quote for us? I will. All right. We should measure the prosperity of the nation, not by the number of millionaires, but by the absence of poverty, the pre prevalence of health, the efficiency of public schools, and the number of people who can and do read worthwhile books. 
All right. What do you guys think the boys were trying to say here? He was trying to say that we shouldn't measure our society's success based on the most successful. Um, so, we should measure it based on education and how healthy people are. That's what he, that was his main argument. He had a counter person whose name was Booker T. Washington. And his main thing is that, yes, you need to get education, but you also need to get a trade. You also need to get a skill. Does everybody follow me on that? Okay. All right. So this is just a quick bio on W.E.B. Du Bois. And then I'm going to talk to you guys about the Jim Crow raps. Okay, y'all? William Edward Burgart Du Bois, later known as W.E.B. Du Bois, was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts on February 23, 1868. As a young man, Du Bois received a B.A. from Fisk University before becoming the first African American to earn a Ph.D. from Harvard in 1895. What is impressive about W.E.B. Du Bois, when he went to Harvard, they wouldn't accept his four-year Fisk degree. Du Bois also faced the problem of not being allowed to stay on the Harvard campus after 6 p.m. So if you put it in context historically, it was a great feat. While teaching at Atlanta University, Du Bois produced a number of academic works, including the Philadelphia Negro in 1899, the first case study of a black community in the United States. Du Bois went into these blighted areas. He found a population that had terrible health issues, a lot of social ills such as poverty, high infant mortality, prostitution. He didn't entirely excuse the African American population, but in his analysis, he was very forceful about pointing out racism as a reason for a lot of these ills. Both Du Bois and Booker T. Washington emerged as advocates of their race. However, as an alternative voice to Washington's book, Up From Slavery, Du Bois published The Souls of Black Folk in 1903. It was an absolutely unique book. It contains poetry, autobiographical sketches, historical articles, memoir, a wide-ranging representation of the diversity of black experience. In 1905, Du Bois founded the Niagara Movement, opposing Booker T. Washington's racial accommodation theory. The organization became the forerunner of the NAACP, and years later, Du Bois was appointed editor of the NAACP magazine, The Crisis. Du Bois wanted The Crisis to have two main components, protest on the one hand and uplift on the other. At the same time that he was protesting, lynching, and race riots, he was building a consciousness while continuing his work for civil rights, Du Bois published his first novel, The Quest of the Silver Fleece, in 1911. Four years later, he published The Negro, the first general history of black Africans. He was one of the early scholars who felt like you could not understand the status and condition of blacks in the United States unless you came to terms with the status and condition of Africa. In 1920, Du Bois published the first of his three autobiographies entitled Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil. Then in 1935, Du Bois published his magnum opus, Black Reconstruction in America. With his three autobiographies, and in a sense you could say his body of work, Du Bois gave us a document of what it was like to be black in the American century. While becoming more influenced by communism, Du Bois made a losing bid for the New York State Senate at the age of 82. By 1961, Du Bois joined the Communist Party and moved to Ghana, where he died on August 27, 1963. W.E.B. Du Bois can be deemed arguably the most profound African-American intellectual of his generation. His ideas are still highly relevant for the present generation of scholars. Okay, so that's a little bit about for my meal kit delivery. I chose the veg. W.E.B. Du Bois, and also that closes us out for what we're talking about with Jim Crow. Has anybody got any questions on anything we spoke about today?